name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. I guess I should say Christ is transfigured. <laughs> this uh, gospel proclamation, you could say, isn't extraordinary. Father, Jesus healed blind people, and it says he went around healing all the, uh, the curing and healing all the folks in, the, in their, their city. What do you mean it's not extraordinary? What, what I mean by, by saying it's not extraordinary is it's, you don't have a lot of dialogue. You don't have a lot of characters represented. And it's just, it seems like a, just an account of Christ doing what Christ does. And then he went about and did it some more. But there's more to it. And I have to tell you, we need to pay attention. Okay, it's the Gospels. We always need to pay attention. It's Scripture. But pay special attention. Whenever there's a healing, whenever there's Pharisees, and especially when there's both, that's important. Because we're meant to see, I guess you could say, a dichotomy. We're meant to see a contrast, anyway. And it's usually meant to point to a contrast within ourselves. Sometimes the Lord uses parables for this. Oftentimes, he uses parables for this. I can't think of a single parable where, uh, well, I probably if I tried, but I can't think of a single parable where there's a don't be that guy, where there isn't a don't be this guy, be this guy. Or where sometimes we're both guys, which one's the best guy to be? But this isn't a parable. This is an actual account of two people who were healed. Two blind men. And you can't imagine that these guys just happened to run into each other randomly. Like, oh, you're blind too. Let's go see if we can talk to Jesus. Uh, these two probably had some sort of community. Uh, maybe, you know, like-minded like folks are, uh, tend to flock together. There's, you know, there might have been like the, the Hebrew Blind People Society uh, of whatever town it was. Uh, these two knew each other. And they suffered together. And Christ was in their midst. The promised one, the holy one of, of Israel was in their midst. And they recognized him. They couldn't see, but they, they could see that it was their God. And they recognized him. And they, of course, called out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. And he didn't do it right away. Surely, as he's going about his... his very brief earthly ministry, there's never a time when there's not a crowd with him. There's never a time when there's not at least some sort of, uh, he, he's creating a stir. This is why he was so vexing both to the, uh, the Hebrews, to the, to, the, to the priests, to the, to the Pharisees and whatnot, and even to, to, to the Roman folks, because any time one of the subjugated peoples was annoyed, it annoyed Caesar, so it's best to not annoy anyone. He had a crowd about him, people who were curious, people who were genuinely hearing his message, it was difficult to get to him. Have you ever been at a place where there's a crowd and there's somebody that the crowd is there to see? Have you ever tried to get close? Well, it's, it's difficult sometimes. Shoot, go to a uh, diocesan event or even a, an all-American council uh, in the Orthodox Church in America and try to go greet the Metropolitan. And There's usually a, a throng of, it's hard to get to see Platika because there's a lot of people around. <laughs> So it's difficult, it was difficult for them to make their way to see Christ. And they call out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. And it says, as soon as he went into the house, they followed him in. They made their way through the crowd and got into the house. And he says, do you believe that this can be done? Yes, Lord, we do. Do you believe that I can do this for you? Yes. Then, to the measure of your faith, may, may, may you be healed. And they were made to see they went out and told everybody, even though he told them not to. He says that, uh, don't tell anyone. And they do it anyway. And then he cures somebody who was possessed by a, a, a demon, a devil, a mute person who was able to speak after the demon was cast out. As soon as he does that, it's almost like this is a repeating story, and a repeating trope in the gospel. The Pharisees are saying, well, yeah, I see the demons are gone and stuff. Well, 
and the blind can see and whatnot, but clearly he cast out demons by the power of the prince of the demons. By the evil one, by Satan's power, he cast out the demons. Surely. Because he's not following our very narrow understanding of how things are to be done and how we're to conduct ourselves. The law was given. The law was good. The law brought order to our lives, to their lives. And it gave direction. And it gave boundaries that made them who they were, that, that gave them their identity as a people and how they ought to behave and how they ought to conduct themselves as the people of God. The law was good. There's nothing about the law given to Moses and to the Israelites and to the Hebrews. There's nothing about it that was bad. It was, it was holy. It is scripture. These are the commands of God. The Lord never at any time contradicts this, but he does fulfill it. They had become so dedicated to the law that they didn't recognize the lawgiver when he was in their midst. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. The king is in their midst, and they don't recognize the king because they're focused so much on the king's law that the king, they're blind to the king. Who was really blind? Was it these men that were blind who had faith in the king who was in their midst or the Pharisees who were blind? You see, there's a, there's a vastness of their spiritual blindness in the midst of compassion. What is compassion? It doesn't mean warm fuzzies, and it certainly doesn't mean affection, but it means to suffer together. These two blind men genuinely suffered together. They represent compassion. What is really going on in the church? What is really going on in our struggle? We're in the fight for our lives. We're in the battle of our lives. What is really happening? How do we fight this battle? By compassion, by suffering together. Compassion means to suffer together. These two were suffering together. And in that compassion, they, they brought themselves into the midst of Christ, who is the most compassionate. And he healed them right there because of their faith in the Lord's perfect, abundant love and compassion. He didn't make the Pharisees blind. He didn't transfer their blindness to the Pharisees. But the Pharisees were truly the blind folks in this gospel proclamation. What, I guess bringing it closer to earth at this point, what is the most practical thing that we can draw from this? We have only to look on any orthodox internet website, any orthodox, um, oh, what do they call those, podcast, or not any, but many, I should say, and you'll find 9,000 different opinions on the same thing by self-proclaimed experts, by people who claim to know this, that, or the other. And some of them do. Some of them are very, very enlightening and uh, uh, edifying. But what you will often find, and this is a tragedy, is a tendency toward rigorism, a tendency toward Phariseeism a tendency towards magnifying the letter of the law above the person who gives it. Christ wasn't following the rules given in the law in this gospel proclamation. But he chose compassion over rigorism and zealotry. Saint Isaac of Nineveh, Saint Isaac the Syrian, said, for those who, I'm going to butcher, I always butcher quotes and you'll have to forgive me, but I'll give you the gist. For, for those who are worshipers of the law or for those who are, are lovers of legalism, put them to shame with your compassion. Put them to shame with your compassion. There is a place for being rigorous in our dedication to God. There is a place for being humbly obedient to the law that has been given. It is when it loses its anchor in humility that the law becomes a weapon. And it's in that situation when it loses its touch to humility where the law convicts you, the person who is the, the, the dedicated follower of the law. There's a time that the law will convict you 
for rigorism. These Pharisees, the, the word, by the way, has got a negative connotation because so often you see these people detached from humility and being rigorous. The Pharisees, it, it's a neutral term. It, it was a specific group of people. Uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were bad. Uh, they were students of the law. They were dedicated to the law and understanding it and recognizing all the fine points of it. That there, there's a goodness to that. There's a usefulness to that. Knowledge of the law and a desire to keep it is good, fundamentally good. But it becomes distorted and unrecognizable when it is no longer rooted in humility. So you see this image in this gospel proclamation. I thought that this gospel proclamation, I've thought for years that it was a difficult one to preach about because I don't always have eyes to see. But it isn't so hard to, to preach about because you have a very stark image of compassion. The Lord saw these people, these blind people, suffering together and he began to suffer with them. And he joined himself to their suffering and through faith they were healed. He will not join himself to what the Pharisees represented because there was no humility. What did the lawgiver himself choose? He chose compassion. You see, compassion is the doorway to paradise. Contempt, which is generally what identifies the Pharisees in these stories that we hear in the gospel. Contempt is the gateway to hell. Contempt is the gateway to pride. It is the gateway to self-absorption and blindness. Contempt makes everyone blind to others. Compassion unites us in Christ and in humility. That is the gospel proclamation that is meant to root itself in our hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Get up! Get up!